Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, yang berbahagia uh, Datuk Datuk, um, fellow panelists, uh, Professor Sexton Sees, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and it's probably too early in the morning because uh, after 30 years in the foreign ministry, there's always a temptation when a diplomat has a mic in front of him is to sing. But uh, I'm not going to do it, especially in the presence of my friend, uh, Datuk Khalid. Uh, who's under secretary for Europe, who's a much better singer than I. So I don't have to embarrass myself. Um, but first, uh, uh, let me uh, thank the organizers uh, for inviting me uh, to speak on this very broad topic of uh, bolstering traditional and non-traditional security partnership in the Indo-Pacific uh, road ahead for stronger EU, ASEAN, Malaysia synergies. Uh, obviously, 15 minutes is not sufficient uh, for me to uh, take um, all of the issues packed in this very uh, uh, very dense um, title. But I'll just uh, want to make a, a couple of points. <clears throat> Let me first uh, begin uh, by perhaps explaining to you what I do at the present moment. Uh, I took on this job on the 30th of May uh, this year after uh, three and a half years stint in, in Beijing. As I mentioned to you, after 30 years in the foreign ministry, and uh, still learning, uh, uh, learning the ropes, as it were. But um, generally, um, I would like to describe my job in this in this way. I do three things at three levels. Uh, firstly, as uh, Director General for National Security, I'm also the Secretary of the National Security Council which the Prime Minister chairs. So in that uh, capacity, I provide policy input to the Prime Minister and to the Council. So that's the first. <clears throat> Second thing that I do is I try my best to uh, implement, uh, to ensure the implementation of all security-related policies of the government across uh, all ministries. And uh, I want to flag one point, that we have a comprehensive definition of security. So it's not just uh, traditional security, non-traditional security, but we're also looking at uh, issues such as uh, climate change, food security, resilience of global supply chains, so on and so forth. Uh, so each uh, government agency has a security component to it. So as I, as I mentioned, I try my best to ensure the implementation of uh, all of these uh, security-related uh, policies. So that's the second thing that I do. Uh, the third thing that I do is I also uh, coordinate um, all of uh, uh, all of the security, all of Malaysian uh, agencies which have a security component, including through including issues such as border management, so on and so forth. So I do those three things, and I do it at three levels. I do external, I do internal. And as uh, chairman of the National Intelligence Committee, I also uh, coordinate all of our intelligence uh, agencies. So basically, I do uh, three people's job on one person's salary. So for those who uh, who are inclined to take over this job, all I can say is think very, very carefully. Um, so that's what I do. Um, so that's the first point. I think the second point that um, I like to emphasize is the changing nature of uh, security globally. Um, if you think about it, um, security is now much more in the forefront of international relations, not only in terms of state-to-state um, -state relations, but also the international multilateral system, but also the way that we think about, uh, about the world. Uh, when I was um, in, in Beijing, there was a historic 20th uh, Party Congress in which President Xi Jinping said that for China, uh, security uh, is the basis of all. It is the basis for social progress, it is the uh, basis for economic growth, and all others. So security is now, at least in the view of the Chinese leadership, in the forefront of national uh, policy making. And uh, this is also reflected in uh, statements by uh, President Biden, uh, Jake Sullivan, the security advisor in the US, so on and so, so forth. 
So security is now much more in the forefront of the world in which we live in, which is very different from the world uh, that was in existence 30 years ago when I first joined the foreign ministry. Uh, for those who recall or remember, in those days, the key word or the buzzword was um, was global economic globalization, which means economic interdependence um, that we would in the uh, neoliberal system uh, we would all basically uh, be capitalists. And uh, the thinking at that time was, you know, countries who trade with one another don't go to war with one another. And that was the ethos um, at that time. And it was on that basis that uh, China was included in the membership of the WTO in 2001. So there was this thinking that um, bring China into the mainstream of the global economy, then with time, they too will evolve uh, into uh, a full-fledged democracy in the way that uh, the West uh, would define what full-fledged democracy, democracy would be. I remember I was in, in Geneva at that time, in 2001, when uh, China joined WTO. And I remember talking to my, uh, my boss, the permanent representative at the time, and asking him whether he shared this view. And he almost prophetically said that uh, it was not going to happen that way because he had served in France and he had served in, in China back in the early 80s. And he said that um, China is too old, too proud, potentially too powerful and too rich to be anything but China. So this idea that uh, you know, China was going to evolve in the way that uh, the West, that Western world thought that it would, was a non-starter to begin with. And I, I said that these words were prophetic, and it, uh, it was, because this is where we are at the present moment. Um, so, that's where we are in terms of uh, security. Um, so, this, has, this thinking has also bled into thinking about economic security. So we now are very familiar with uh, phases such as onshoring, friendshoring, offshoring, so on and so forth, uh, which all speaks to the desire of very many countries um, to enjoy <coughs> secure uh, and resilient uh, supply chains. Uh, this emanates obviously from uh, COVID-19 when uh, people in the West woke up to the fact that uh, very much of the things that we consume on a daily basis is uh, produced uh, in China. And I can certainly attest to that um, because uh, for those who've done, who've done uh, trade issues, you know that there is something called uh, an HS code, which basically um, identifies each type of product into certain categories. And China is the only country which produces everything that there is in the table of HS codes. There's no other country which does that. This is an exceptional situation for, for China for China to be in. And uh, they have and will continue to have a large advantage of 1.4 billion people. And um, this is an advantage which no other country has in the world, including now the largest country in the world, which is, uh, which is India. I'll give you an example of what 1.4 billion people uh, can do for your economy. I went to uh, Guang, Guangdong, the southern part of uh, China, uh, 100 million people, which is the industrial heartland of uh, China, and uh, which, if you uh, take it out of China, and if you consider it as a separate economy, would be, I think, the 11th largest economy in the world, 100 million people. And I was uh, taken to uh, a factory which produces uh, these uh, screen protectors, thin glass ones and uh, they said that it was the largest in the world a uh, very sophisticated machine uh, so I asked them did you produce this machine uh, yourself so I said this machine we produce ourselves but this is the fifth generation of machines so the first generation came from Germany so what they did was they reverse engineered so they created a second machine based on the first 
and the uh, and the product uh, was not as good as obviously as the first, and not as good as the first, but they still managed to sell it uh, in, in the Chinese market at a cheaper price. So because they were able to produce this inferior good, you know they had money coming in, so there's not a cash flow problem. And since it's not a, a publicly listed company, they were able to uh, to spend upwards of 30% into research. So they developed a second machine, third machine, fourth machine, this fifth machine, which is even much, much better than the first machine in Germany. So this is a huge advantage uh, for, for China. And so there is, then this advantage is absent for any other country in the world. There's no other country which is able to do it. This combination of ingenuity, the combination of a huge market, uh, this uh, combination of, frankly, um, a tradition of inventiveness. And because people talk about uh, China ripping off technology from the West, so on and so forth, I won't deny that this thing, uh, that this, this happens. But you must not forget that uh, Chinese civilization is a civilization of 5,000 years. And they have been a very inventive uh, civilization since almost the very beginning. You think about gunpowder, navigation, paper, uh, silk, um, obviously. These are all Chinese inventions. So they're not Johnny come ladies when it comes to, uh, uh, to inventiveness and inventions. So it's a huge uh, uh, advantage for China. And uh, this explains why they are where they are now. And again, for someone who thinks about this, who was paid to think about these things on a daily basis, I always argue that uh, it is not right to use the term China's rise. It's not correct. The phrase that we ought to use is China's re-emergence. Because where they are, where they will be, as was what they were, is in the natural order of things. This is how it is for thousands of years. Up to 1820, they were, uh, for 2,000 years, they were the largest economy in the world. It fell behind, obviously, because of the Industrial Revolution and uh, colonialization, or partial colonialization, if you want to think about it in those terms. But now they are emerging, and this is how it is. And, uh, and for a country like Malaysia, having dealt with China for, again for thousands of years, we, we dealt with, uh, with, uh, with China when they were strong, we dealt with China when they were weak, and we will deal with China when they are strong again. And this is the reality, which a country like Malaysia cannot, cannot escape from. So that's the second point that I like to, to make, and uh, which is uh, on, on the inevitable rise of China. Third point is, obviously, uh, as uh, Professor Rogers mentioned, about uh, contestation between uh, US, uh, US and China. This is, this is the reality. And, um, and, and for a country like Malaysia, as well as uh, countries in, in, in the region, um, in fact, I was, uh, I was recently, last week, in both uh, Jakarta and Singapore, calling on my counterparts. One of the issues which we talked about is this. Um, it is obvious that um, Southeast Asia is the uh, in, in the front line of U.S. Uh, China contestation. This is this is this is the reality. But I just want to make a few sub points in this in this respect. First sub point is those who say that there is a common Southeast Asian view on China or China related matters is either a fool or a charlatan. Because there is no one common Southeast Asian view on, uh, on China. Because we have a very complicated relationship with, uh, with China, due in large part in very many countries to the presence of ethnic Chinese in our societies. This is the reality. In the case of Malaysia, our business model is very clear. You, uh, all races will keep their identity. There is a common basis of understanding, a social contract, which um, everybody respects and should respect and need to continue to respect. 
but they're different. So we have Chinese schools, we have Tamil schools, and so forth. So this is our business model. In Indonesia, obviously, it's different. In Singapore, it's different. In Thailand is also very different. So our relations with, with China, and this is what I always say to uh, uh, to people who want to think about Southeast Asian relations with China, is that it is incredibly complicated because it strikes at the heart of our national nation building philosophy. And this is absent with almost any other country uh, in the region. We do have uh, migrants uh, from India, obviously, but they are not as large a part, uh, at least in numerical terms, as, uh, as, as ethnic Chinese. And this is the reality. And one of the reasons why Malaysia has very good relations with, with China is that, obviously, ethnic Chinese uh, 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 constitute about 22 to 23 percent of our population. And any government that comes to power, or wants to come to power, will need to address uh, their concerns as voters. This is part of the democratic process. This is a reality. So obviously, uh, there is an incentive for any political party in the country who wants to gain power to have good relations with China, in addition to them being the largest trading niche, uh, our largest uh, trading partner, a major source of investment, and so forth. So, so this, is, this, is, this is the reality. Um, what about the US? I say this very frankly, and I say this to uh, American friends too. When I began uh, surveys, in the, when, when I first began in this business, you know, we prided ourselves on this policy of equidistance between China and the US. So we were there, China was here and the US was here, but the US have moved away further and further. China has become closer and closer. So unless, unless uh, we move in order to become to maintain our policy of equidistance, uh, we'll be closer and closer to China. But what does movement mean? Movement means um, changing our worldview, changing our foreign policy, which has been very consistent, which has been very coherent, but most importantly, for, for democracy like Malaysia, which, which enjoys public support. Malaysian foreign policy enjoys broad public support. So that's why regardless of governmental changes, it remains the same. So, like it or not, as the Americans move further and further away and the Chinese come closer and closer, this is the reality that Malaysia needs to deal with. Deal with. And I say this in all frankness. Um, I still have a couple of minutes more, but maybe some of these issues we'll take up in, uh, in the question and answer session. I'd just like to end by, uh, by talking about uh, ASEAN-EU-Malaysia relations. And I, I've, I've been told, and this is a sentiment that I agree with completely, that uh, ASEAN and the EU are like Venus. We're not from Mars. Because we both believe uh, in the importance of international law, we believe in the importance of dialogue as a means of uh, uh, res resolving difficulties. Uh, we abjure the use of violence as a means of achieving the national aims. So basically, um, on these very fundamental points, ASEAN and EU are the same. But ASEAN and EU are obviously very different beasts. You know, uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, the EU, it's much more institutionalized. In ASEAN, it's not, and I don't think we are going to be institutionalized in the way that the EU is. For one reason is, and this is something which people often forget, that members of ASEAN are doing a lot of things simultaneously. You know, we are almost all of us are still in the process of nation building. One, we are in the uh, process of uh, promoting uh, regionalism, which is a very difficult exercise given the variety of countries in, in ASEAN. And thirdly, we are all trying to be our best to get plugged even more deeply into the, main, into the mainstream of the global system, in which we are uh, the uh, rule takers and the, uh, the rule makers. So it's a very complicated situation which members of ASEAN find ourselves in. Um, so, 
ASEAN, EU, very different. But we operate, I think, on the same operating system, the same platform, uh, which uh, undergirds the philosophy of both uh, ASEAN and EU. Having said that, and having dealt with uh, colleagues from the, uh, from, uh, from the EU, um, it is obvious that uh, at, a, at an institutional level, ASEAN and EU understand each other only superficially. Frankly, we in ASEAN have no idea how the, how the EU is run. And I suspect that colleagues in the EU has no idea what Southeast Asia is all about. And I say this very frankly to, to EU colleagues. The tendency in the EU and in the West more generally is that they see uh, ASEAN in the way that they themselves are. You know, that there's a there's a highway with uh, very clear road signs, with uh, clear stripes on the road, uh, etc. Which is not the case of ASEAN. You know, I always say that if you want to understand ASEAN, you don't think of it in the metaphor of a highway, but you have to think of it as boats on the surface of the sea, bobbing up and down with the passing of the tide. This is what uh, ASEAN, uh, ASEAN is all about. So, as much as uh, we in ASEAN want to say that ASEAN is uh, we're going down the path of rulemaking and things like that, it's very much work in progress. And because as I mentioned to you, we're in, in, in three complex, distinct but interrelated processes, as I mentioned, nation building, region building, as well as plugging ourselves into the, uh, into the mainstream of the global economy and the global system. <coughs> So I'll just, uh, I think I've probably run out of time, so I'll stop at that uh, by way of giving you some idea of how we in Malaysia think about, uh, uh, think about the world. It's very complicated, very challenging. More than happy uh, to answer questions which you may have